warships going aground is nothing new. In the Age of Sail, when ships were much more at the mercy of wind and waves, it was unfortunately quite common. Uh, for example, during the Napoleonic Wars, ships being wrecked in this way was the single greatest cause of losses amongst the Royal Navy by a considerable margin. The arrival of steam power did change this somewhat, as ships now had a means to fight against storms and the like that might have driven them ashore otherwise, but this still left the problem of navigational errors and uncharted obstacles. There is, of course, a common perception that warships in the early part of the 20th century must have known where they were going to a far greater extent than they did in the past. But that difference in the early part of the 20th century was not actually as great as you might imagine. They had charts, they knew their speed and bearing, and they could calculate longitude and latitude by means of sextants, astronomical observations, and clocks. But these were all things that had been available in one form or another for almost a century and a half. Theoretically, the calculation of speed was more consistent and more easily known now, but this was simply slightly better data going into existing methods of calculation, and not a new means of calculating location. Now, that isn't to say that technology wasn't advancing at all. Radio bearing and triangulation beacons were being developed, for example, but there was nothing like modern GPS systems. Generally, when in sight of land, references would be taken from known points, and when at sea, longitude and latitude could be calculated using the aforementioned solar or astronomical observations combined with a reliable clock. But in between these fixings, an even older system known as dead reckoning was used. This had been used for a very long time and was relatively simple. You had your known starting point, and in theory you would hope that you knew your own speed and bearing. So, for example, at 20 knots you were travelling at about 23 miles an hour. So if you travelled on a heading of 270 degrees for 2.5 hours, or 2.5 hours, you would in theory be 57.5 miles directly west of where you started. Of course, even in a steam-powered ship, wind, waves and currents could affect this, and the method of calculation assumed that you were going at a constant speed, and that your bearing in the first place was accurate, so inevitably errors would creep in over time hence the corrective observations that you would take where possible. And this was one reason why local knowledge and or good charts were vital, since these would allow you to factor in corrections for known currents and wind effects, which would increase your accuracy somewhat. So, now that that brief foray into naval navigation in the early 20th century is out of the way, let's get to the main subject of this video, the Honda Point disaster. Honda Point is not actually in Japan, it's part of the California coastline, about midway between San Francisco and San Diego, where the coastline takes a sharp turn from running generally south by southeast, coming down from San Francisco, to run almost directly east for a while, before bearing east by southeast down towards the intervening point of Los Angeles. Honda Point is surrounded by a number of rocks and shoals, and this has made it something of a navigational issue for pretty much as long as shipping has plied the coast. It stands just north of the Santa Barbara Channel, which is a sea lane that runs along the California coast, which is somewhat protected from the open ocean by a chain of small islands. This is all important information because on September the 8th, 1923, a whole squadron of brand new Clemson-class destroyers were steaming south under the overall command of Commodore Edward Watson making up most of Destroyer Squadron 11. Watson had already served in three wars, but this was his first time in charge of multiple ships. The intended path that the ships were to follow was down the coast from San Francisco, heading for the then base of the Pacific Fleet in San Diego, via the Santa Barbara Channel. This was not just your day-to-day -day transit, however. It was supposed to be a navigation exercise conducted under wartime conditions, and this was especially welcomed aboard the destroyers as, thanks to budget cuts immediately post-World War I, fuel consumption had been carefully rationed, and the previous year destroyers had not been allowed to exceed 15 knots when cruising or making passage between ports. 
but in this financial year there'd been a little bit of a bump in funding that meant they were now granted permission to use the trip to San Diego for a 20 knot run in order to test their cruising turbines. This meant that the ships would not be allowed to slow down to take depth soundings, which was something that was still done with a weighted line, nor could they check the coast or the sun as weather conditions had turned into a heavy fog. Instead, the squadron found itself following the flagship, USS Delphi, where the formation's course was being calculated using the old dead reckoning method, with bearings being taken from the compass and speed being taken from a known table that showed how many revolutions per minute of the ship's screws corresponded to a given speed through the water, adjusted for the relatively well-known typical speeds of currents in the area. In this respect, there was already a minor flaw as the Delphi's gyro compass had broken down, forcing her to rely only on the magnetic compass, which, as it turned out, had a small two-degree error in bearing, although this would be far from the main contributory factor. There was one other method of finding out where they were. The new system of radio beacons had recently been installed in the area, and some ships in the little formation, including the Delphi, had been fitted with receivers to take their signals. As time wore on, the apparent position as indicated by the beacons began to drift from the positions that had been calculated aboard the ship. But the Delphi's captain decided to ignore the radio beacon's data, believing that his own calculations were more accurate than what he viewed as relatively untested new technology. This data would be ignored multiple times during the day, despite the beacons being requested to give bearings on several occasions. And so, after spending some time steaming south by southeast in three columns abreast, each column being of five ships, the calculations showed that they were almost directly west of the entrance to the Santa Barbara Channel. And so the Delphi turned to port, with the squadron in close formation starting to turn in line. Normally, You'd check your dead reckoning in this area by taking sightings of five lighthouses that were along the route, but only the first of these, Pigeon Point, had been sighted, just before lunchtime, and the turn into the apparent channel was taken at 2100 hours, 9 o'clock at night, significantly after they'd had last sight of land. Unfortunately, the squadron was in fact quite a bit north by northeast of where they thought they actually were. The radio beacon readings, as it turned out, had been correct. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, they'd adopted a line ahead formation, and so when the flagship made its turn to port at nine o'clock, the rest of the ships followed in an orderly queue. However, it was to be the third ship in line, USS Young, that would be the first casualty as she tore open her hull on a submerged section of the shoal, capsizing to starboard and taking 20 men with her at 4 minutes past 9. A minute later, at a cruising speed of 20 knots, the USS Delphi ran aground hard, the collision killing three men. Immediately upon impact, the ship began to sound her siren as a warning to others of unexpected obstacles, but for many it was too late. The squadron was amongst a rocky shoal just offshore, and one after another, ships began to pile into solid objects. This wasn't helped by the Delphi, believing that they'd actually overshot the channel and hit one of the islands to the south of it, directing everybody to turn 90 degrees to port again, effectively reversing their course, which would take them back to the Santa Barbara Channel if Watson's guess as to their position was correct, but in fact due to it being horribly wrong, all this would actually do, if followed, would be to send the ships into the coastline further north. But for many, it was too late in any case. The USS SP Lee was the second ship in line. It saw the flagship come to a sudden dead halt and swung to port to avoid what they thought was an uncharted rock, and instead they ran full tilt into the rather solid California coast. Next was USS Woodbury, which reacted by turning to starboard. This, in turn, meant that they hit a rock somewhat offshore. USS Nicholas tried SP Lee's port turn strategy, hoping that being further back would allow them to get out of danger, but they hit yet another rock. The USS Fuller made a similar decision, except they went to starboard, and ended up fetching up next to the Woodbury, so at least they had some company. <laughs> 
Finally, USS Chauncey was far enough back to see the young go over on its side, and they manoeuvred to try and rescue survivors in the water. But in so doing, they also ran aground as the young's propellers opened up the Chauncey's hull as the undertow threw them together, leaving the ship powerless against the current. USS Farragut and USS Summers also took some damage, the former colliding with the somewhat less fortunate USS Fuller as it desperately slowed and evaded whilst Fuller ploughed right on through, and in the latter case the Summers took serious damage sideswiping a rock but did manage to extricate itself. The remaining ships further back, the Percival, Kennedy, Paul Hamilton, Stoddart and Thompson, had sufficient warning and avoided the trap. This was helped by Commander Roper aboard the Kennedy, and in charge of the subdivision that made up the last few ships, instructing his vessels to slow and turn away from the path of the rest of the squadron before the impact occurred, as Kennedy had also been receiving the radio beacons information, and he was significantly more confident about the accuracy of their data than the flagship had been, and so he'd realised where they were going, albeit a bit too late to save the lead ships. Somewhat unsurprisingly, several thousand tons of metal running full tilt into solid rock, combined with the wail of a ship's siren, is in fact relatively noticeable, and so rescue efforts got underway almost before the ships had stopped moving. As the ships had gone aground, one of the things that was available to them was the Breaches Boy system, which can basically be summed up as a life belt attached to a zip line that is then fired at a ship in distress from the shore, or at the shore from the ship in distress, via a rocket or harpoon launcher. A few nearby locals started to use these to assist the nearer ships that were aground, along with some of the crew that had managed to make it ashore. Nearby fishing vessels, as well as intact members of the squadron, were able to deploy boats, as well as manoeuvre their own ships in at slow speed to try and pick survivors out of the water, as well as rescue some of those in the more unstable ships that were aground. Thanks to its grounding nearby in a relatively upright state, the Chauncey, although wrecked, was able to accept survivors from the young, which was of course on its side and in much worse states. The captain of the Nicholas, which had ended up stern first near the shore and pinned against rocks on her starboard side, actually made the decision to keep his crew on board until daylight. The crews of the Woodbury and Fuller, which were grounded furthest away from the shore, ended up finding temporary refuge on a large chunk of lava rock, which thereafter acquired the name Woodbury Rock. It was a somewhat miserable night, as most of the sailors were in their sleeping gear, the water was cold, and the wind was not pleasant at all. Therefore, using what kindling and wood was available from their ships, which clearly weren't going anywhere anytime soon, a few fires were started, although with the wind and the spray this was as much to raise everybody's spirits and provide a little bit of light as it was to actually spread any useful heat. The crews of the Delphi and Chauncey discovered that there was a narrow ledge at the foot of a very tall cliff, but some sailors actually managed to climb their way up, found lines, dropped them down, and began hauling some of their friends to safety at the top of the cliff which, in daylight, it would turn out, was actually linked to the mainland by a natural plateau. This was a story that was repeated with variations a short distance to the north, where the S.P. Lee's crewmen were able to establish a raft ferry to the shore, followed by a rather difficult climb. The crew aboard the capsized USS Young had the worst of it. There had been fatalities from the capsizing in the first place, and although some of the crew had made it to the Chauncey or onto the shore, several sailors were trapped below when the ship rolled over, and others had been washed out into the sea. A number of survivors found themselves clinging to the port side, which was somewhat slippery, with many of them holding on to the openings created by smashing in the porthole windows, which gave them some grip, albeit a grip on broken glass. The wave action on the powerless Chauncey had caused her to be driven past the young, and it was this manoeuvre that meant that they were so close together. Chauncey's stern was only 25 yards away, and so many of the crew were able to use it not just as a refuge, but as a kind of bridge to the more secure shoreline. Given the sheer amount of damage that had occurred to the ships that had gone aground compared to the cost of 
re just reactivating some of the other Clemsons that had effectively been completed straight into reserve, it was more cost effective to simply leave the ships in place after stripping the more valuable things such as the guns and torpedo launchers. What remained was sold for scrap, but due to their position and a series of rather comically inept scrap companies, the hulks were generally left in place for years to come. More than half a decade later, when the German airship Graf Zeppelin showed up on its round-the-world voyage, they were still there, and were filmed from the air. Since the ships had been lost, a court-martial had to be convened, and at this point, a number of interesting facts began to emerge. The destroyers had not been alone in their navigational difficulties, as the same day the steamship SS Cuba had run aground nearby, and a number of other ships had reported navigational difficulties. Indeed, finding survivors from the SS Cuba had been something that was reported to the squadron as it had been underway heading south. But why was everybody in the area having navigational issues or running aground? Well, it seemed to be linked back to the Great Canto Earthquake that had occurred a week earlier incidentally wrecking the hull of the incomplete battlecruiser Amagi and being solely responsible for the existence of the aircraft carrier Karga. But anyway, why could had an earthquake on the other side of the planet suddenly become relevant to a bunch of US Navy destroyers making a navigational error off the California coast? Well, that all comes down to that dead reckoning system of navigation. Remember at the start when we talked about making corrections for wind, wave and current action? Well, that's because if you're heading in a given direction at, say, 20 knots, and there's a 3-knot cross-current, you're going to be pushed sideways, which means that not only will you be somewhat to one side of your target, but because you've been travelling at an angle that's best described as the hypotenuse of a right-angle triangle, whilst you might be turning the screws for 20 knots, your actual speed relative to your fixed start and end points such uh, such as ports, will be less, and thus you won't have gone as far. Likewise, if the waves are larger, these will have a cumulative impact on distance travelled, as large wave impacts will slow the ship briefly with every single hit. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to unusual sea conditions. As a result of the huge disturbances off the sea, on the seabed off Japan, the area of the California coast had, starting a few days after the earthquake, been experiencing large swells and waves, as well as strong and unusual currents going in different directions, something that would continue well into the second week after the earthquake. During a normal sunny day, ships could correct their position by observation of the sun or observation of the land, with those five lighthouses in particular being taken. But in the heavy fog, where none of these could be seen, a correction based on expected sea conditions would turn out to be completely wrong, with the unusual conditions pushing the ships roughly northeast compared to where they might think they were via dead reckoning. Uh, thanks to the earthquake, things were even more complex than you might imagine. The destroyers weren't actually operating with a head sea that was just blatantly slowing them down, which they might have been able to account for. They were actually operating in a heavy following sea, and the surges were constantly pitching the sterns of the ship upwards, causing the propellers to breach out of the water. This, in turn, prevented an accurate count of the propeller revolution, since, of course, out of the water, the propellers would spin much, much faster. And since it was propeller revolutions per minute which were the basis for calculating the ship's speed, at various points during the journey, they were estimating their speed at about 21 knots, when the actual passage through the water was probably closer to about 19, due in part to the pitching, and in part to the temporary loss of propulsive force that was associated with the props coming out of the water. Additionally, the winds were somewhat more brisk than usual and coming up from the west-southwest, which, coupled with a strong current that was running towards the shore, added to the steadily accumulating navigational errors and, as we said, pushed the ships to the northeast. As a result, by the time they'd reached what they thought was the Santa Barbara Channel, they were well short, and that left turn had obviously headed straight for the coastline. 
During the court-martial itself, Lieutenant Commander Hunter, who was the normal navigator aboard the Delphi and who had been superseded in his navigational duties for this voyage by the ship's captain, testified that, and quote, I think there is also a possibility that abnormal currents caused by the Japanese earthquake might have been another contributory cause. All magnetic disturbances connected with the solar eclipse affected the compass, but of these I cannot, of course, speak with any first-hand knowledge, end quote. So a case could be made that there wasn't anything that could have been done by the destroyer squadron, given the outside context problem of the earthquake's effects. Nonetheless, there were two factors that mitigate against this view. Firstly, the correct navigational data had been available from the radio beacon system, which the last subdivision of Destroyer Squadron 11 had in fact taken account of, but the flagship had ignored. This was further put to the test by the fact that Destroyer Squadron 12, following some distance behind after exercises, had noticed the discrepancy between their own dead reckoning and the signals from the beacons, and had slowed to work out why this was occurring, choosing to trust the beacons' data and making a relatively trouble-free passage. Secondly, the court ruled that, in addition to there being a fault with the fleet commander and the flagship's navigators, any captain's first responsibility is to his own ship, even when they're in formation, and thus each captain of a vessel that ran aground also had to be charged. The court-martial ruled that the events of the Honda Point disaster were directly attributable to bad errors and faulty navigation by Captain Watson of the Delphi, who was stripped of his seniority, with three other officers admonished. Outside of this, however, the officers who were court-martialed were all acquitted, with Captain Watson, on the other hand, being commended for taking full responsibility and not trying to excuse the disaster. On the brighter side of things, Commander Roper was recommended for a letter of commendation for turning his division away from the danger and keeping the rearward section of the formation afloat. So there you have it, the Honda Point disaster, a somewhat embarrassing incident for the US Navy and indeed the largest loss of US Navy vessels in peacetime. And of course it's an incident for whose causes you can argue from either side. It's entirely possible, and indeed a solid argument to say, that Destroyer Squadron 11's commander should have paid attention to the data from the radio beacons, and then he would have been able to avoid the accident. On the other hand, you can also make an argument that his dead reckoning was affected by unusual conditions which he couldn't account for, and that if those conditions hadn't been present, he likely wouldn't have gone aground. But in either case, I hope this sheds a little bit more light on this rather interesting incident, and I look forward to seeing the discussion that will no doubt result in the comments below. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.